He said, uh, it's the only church I ever heard where the preacher uses analogies of uh, blazing saddle movie uh, in his sermons. I said, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. I got to admit, I'm not in 100% shape. This morning, I came out here to give Miss Debbie my scriptures to put in the computer. And uh, how many of you would vote to just double the salary of Tim and Miss Fox? Hey, man, I give that motion and second it. And all in favor? All right, you guys will be expecting to see that on your next check. But I came out here barefooted, and I gave her that stuff. And when I hit that ramp on that carpet, that looks like carpet, but it walks like ice, uh, I, this foot slipped out from underneath me. And it it actually it broke my ankle. And then I fell with this leg somehow weirdly pretzeled up underneath me. And I'm sure it broke my hip. And my finger, it's bruised. I, I raked it all the way down the door only to be stopped by the ramp itself. And when I saw it, it was hanging back down here. And I put it back in place. And I immediately, Miss Debbie said, are you all right? And I said to myself, it's going to take more than that to keep me from getting in this pulpit. But do you know we have people that haven't been to this church for probably a year because a year ago they got a puppy? Now I'm going to say some things today that may cost me a few friends. Uh, I don't have many. But I don't think we get it. Me included. We're in this campaign. We're calling it the campaign, Who Cares? And um, I know several of you uh, have told me you've invited uh, countless people. Unless you count my backslidden sister and brother-in-law that haven't been here in two weeks. Cody is our first visitor in four weeks. I invited him. It's tough out there. Let me tell you this story. So this week I had a lady tell me, she said, I ran into this woman that used to come to church here. And I invited her to come back. And... She didn't know if she could come back. She quit coming here supposedly because uh, her and her husband brought their teenage lesbian daughter. And when they brought her, I said something about LGBTQ. And so they left the church. This lady said, I told her, well, at least watch a few of his sermons on Sunday morning because they've been a lot better. This is my life. She said, I, I told the woman. She looked me right in the face and said, I told her, well, at least listen to some of his Sunday morning sermons. Lately, they've been a lot better because he hadn't been harping on that. My heart broke. I thought, do you mean to tell me I haven't been harping on that? So for the last three weeks, I've been harping on, I think the problem is motivation. We're not motivated to share the gospel with lost people for whatever reason. And I've tried to pick out reason after reason after reason. And then after that conversation, I thought, no, it's not motivation. It's not motivation at all. I am so stupid. It's lack of knowledge. Because there ain't no way this side of hell that you could convince me that you good people would not share the good news with everybody you meet if you knew what the good news was. So this morning, like it, lump it, dump it, dump it, 
before you leave out those beautiful wrought iron doors, you're going to know why this is so important and, and what happened to you when you gave your life to Christ and you received Christ. Now, I'm going to hurry. I got seven points. Somebody said, oh my gosh. <laughs> They'll be quick. I'm crippled. I assure you I need medical attention. It's not, it's not motivation. I don't think so. I think it's education. People just don't know. Look at Hebrews 2, 3. A lot of Scripture this morning. I hope it's not too much Scripture for you. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, that means you've received salvation and you neglect it. How are you going to escape? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. So what makes this so great of salvation? What makes our salvation so great? Well, you need to go to the chapter called the gospel chapter. It's 1 Corinthians 15. It is the clearest uh, explanation of the gospel of this age. Now there is at least seven, count them, seven Seven different Gospels in seven different dispensations in this one book. In the dispensation we live in, this is the Gospel. This is the good news. And it's so great. But I don't think most people that have received it understand how great it was if, if if they knew i just can't believe if they knew how great it was that they wouldn't want to share it with everybody else so first corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 here you go moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand by which also you are saved. you got to hear this gospel to be saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Okay, so Christ died for your sins. He died for your sins. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. He died for your sins, which are way more, I'm sure, than my sins, but he died for my sins too. It's a joke. Somebody got it, okay? And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Don't When you're sharing the Gospel, don't ever leave him on the cross. The cross was a necessity. The cross is where the payment was applied but the victory was the resurrection so don't leave him on the cross like a catholic he ain't on there okay that's the gospel he died and he rose again so paul is speaking to the church in corinth and then he says this in the same chapter to this church in Corinth. But he's saying it to us today. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32. Watch this. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What does that mean? What he's saying there is when he was at the church at Ephesus and he was there a long time, he was only at Thessalonica 21 days. And he taught them everything about the end time, Antichrist, you name it, in 21 days. And in 2 Thessalonians, he comes back and says, Hey, you bunch of dum-dums, that is not what I told you. I told you this. 
Well, actually, 2 Thessalonians should be 3 Thessalonians because some low-down, sorry, no count, wrote a letter which was the second letter to the Thessalonians at the church at Thessalonica, and they signed Paul's name to it. Have you ever had anybody falsely accuse you or lie on you? Paul writes them a letter and says, that's not what I taught you in those 21 days. I taught you this. But he says while he was at Ephesus, he fought beast. Well, do you think he's out there <laughs> wrestling bears for money? No. He's talking about people in the church at Ephesus. Some of them were beast. He said, if after the manner of men I have fought with beast at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? I will say it to you today. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if you're not going to rise from the dead one day to be with Him forever, what are we doing here? He says, why did I wrestle with these terrible people in Ephesus if the dead don't rise? If this is all there is, eat, drink, and be merry. Did you understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about honoring and living for God. I'm talking about doing something with your life. You've been given the free will from God. You can make your choice to do anything you want to. And instead of living your life for yourself, you live it for Him. If that doesn't matter, why? Let me tell you something. I'll tell you. I'll tell you straight up. If I had a teenage daughter that was a lesbian, I would go to my preacher. I would get down on my knees and I'd say, please, when I bring her here, first of all, if my daughter's a teenage daughter or if my daughter's 40 years old and she's living in my house and she's scooting her little feet under my table, she's coming to church when I come to church. But if I had a lesbian daughter, I'd get on my knees and I'd beg my preacher, preacher, if you can find it in your heart, please, please say something about the sin that my daughter is in. Maybe your problem's not motivation. Maybe your problem's education. You need some education if you have children in your family that are living lives of sin and you don't want the preacher to say anything about it. I wouldn't give you two dead flies for a preacher that mount the pulpit and not call sin, sin. And let me tell you how this works. It's going to be rough today. It started out rough. I broke my ankle, my hip, my finger. You think you're having a hard time sitting here? Let me tell you how this works. There is a hell. There's a heaven to gain. This we're not playing uh, we're not playing hopscotch. Whatever happened to those old, they called them leather lung preachers. That, that you knew when you walked through the door, you were probably going to get it. Whatever happened to people that came to church religiously, and if they didn't feel uh, beat up and, and, and called out, and when they left the church, they didn't think their preacher done their job. If you've got a child in sin or a spouse in sin or a loved one in sin, don't you understand? The only way out for them is that somebody would preach to them the truth of God. And what I want to show you this morning is 
what you're preaching to them is what they have to gain. And it's so great. It's so wonderful. Your life of sin does not compare. You've been deceived. You've been tricked. Watch what Paul tells them. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it in me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If all this is is this life, live it up, baby. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. If somebody tries to tell you, well, I don't, I don't, I don't believe, uh, I want to go to a church where the preacher says this is sin and that is sin. I don't want to hear about sin. I want to hear about love. You can ask Stacy, our little beloved Trayvon Pollard left here. Put a post and a video on Facebook. Stacy, with tears in his eyes, sent it to me. He said, watch this. Trayvon Fuller said, listen, I don't care about your denomination. I don't care about your biblical doctrine. I don't care about what you hold to be true. All I care about is if you love. That's straight out of the pit of hell. I wouldn't cut out a word of it if he was sitting right there. Matter of fact, I went to his store the next day. I said, that's straight out of the pit of hell, brother. The Bible says itself is for doctrine. It's for reproof. It's for rebuke. The book rebukes me every time I open it. I I try to be good to it and I pat it and I think, if I open you real gently, will you just not blister my hide again? Watch what he says. Uh, Evil communication corrupts good manners. Here's the verse. This is what he said to that church. This is what Paul has to say to this church. Awake, wake yourself up to righteousness. Well, we're going to figure out what that means. And sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. That's what got me thinking. It ain't about motivation. It's about education. That's the only problem. People don't have the knowledge of God. They don't realize how great a salvation, how great this gift is. Because if they did, they couldn't keep from telling everybody. Let a restaurant open in Barsville. Everybody you see will be talking about it. But people never talk about Jesus. Watch what he says. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So I entitle this sermon, that's all introduction. Shame on us. Shame on us. Maybe it's that people don't have the knowledge of God. Shame on us. Why is it called the gospel? The word gospel means good news. The good news is you can receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ in exchange for your unrighteousness. It's the best deal in the world. Jesus' righteousness. The word means right standing. You can be given as a gift Jesus' right standing with the Father for your not right standing with the Father. For your can't get right. That's the good news. To a sinner, no matter what the sin, I've said this a thousand times, 
You don't have to be a murderer to go to hell. You don't have to be a homosexual to go to hell. You don't have to be a thief to go to hell. There's a million ways to go. There's only one way to go to heaven. So when we refuse to share the good news, shame on us. I'm going to go through these real fast. Number one, what does this greatest salvation, what does it mean? It means imputation. You say, well, what is the word imputation? God keeps a record like Santa Claus. God keeps a book. God has recorded everything you've ever done, good or bad. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 5.10. We're talking about imputation. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Look at... Uh, Revelations 20 verse 12 God keeps books and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works God keeps a book this is my book You'll notice it's got my name in it. It says, Sermon Jacob's works, good and bad. It's got some things written down in it. Everything good and everything bad I ever done. Page after page after page. Well, here's what happened. First page says, born November 7th, 1964. That was a good day, vintage year. It was the exact same day, almost to the exact same minute that Billy Graham was born. Not the same year. Pretty good day. I just want to read you a few things. April the 6th, 1968. This is the record of my life. He was very kind to his sister, Nora. Oh, no, no, it's riddled through here. Let me, let me pick another page here. August 17th, 1970. Wrestled with his little puny brother, Butch, and tried to kill him. That's my record. May 10th, 1974. Used a little boy with leprosy to steal candy from the grocery store. I've told that story before. Had a little friend in school. He had epilepsy. He would sometimes have grandma fits or whatever they're called. Well, me and my criminal mind, I, one day I said, Hey, dude, if you'd go back there by the meat and start flopping in the floor with one of those fits, me and this other kid, we'll steal a bunch of candy and we'll split it with you. So we go in the store. And uh, the little epileptic boy goes back there, and we're waiting, and all we hear, Oh, my God! Oh, my God! And the woman runs from the clerk, and the butcher comes out of the back that owned the store, and we packed our sacks full of candy. Well, being three fat kids, didn't take us very long. It's probably 48 hours. We're like, hey, let's do this again. You're fixing to have another epileptic fit. So... He goes back there to the back. We're standing there by the candy. We hear, oh my God, oh my God. And we start filling our bags full of candy. And I got this feeling somebody was looking. And I was down on my knees and I looked up. And the butcher that owned the grocery store had this bloody apron on and a meat cleaver. <laughs> and he said, can I help you boys? He had figured it out, right? Well, that's got wrote down here. October the 14th, 1977, born again.
Had one more thing on here. I told my Sunday school class last week about this. Confession's good for the soul. Back years ago, you could get a nickel or a quarter for a glass pop bottle. You guys remember that? Well, we had this kid in school. My sister knew him. Didn't you date him a couple times? His name was Clinton Watson. She didn't ever tell you. Clinton Watson uh, was a great big goony goo goo boy, and his parents were like 60 when they had him, and uh, his dad was a machinist, and so he dressed and looked like a machinist in school, had that chambray shirt tucked in, belt, and black steel-toed uh, machinist shoes. He's kind of an outcast. But I kept going to his house and inviting him to church and come to find out he was grounded for a year. And then he got grounded for another year because he told people he was grounded for a year because he went out toward the lake when it was iced over. Finally, his mom relented and let him start going with the church to different places and stuff. He could go skating and different outings like that, but not much. She's real protective of her baby. She's like... Chrissy White's baby, Jace. He, Clinton was like six foot six and 400 pounds, you know. But Clinton messed up and told me about his collection of pop bottles. And so me and another kid, I told that kid one day, well, the store's just a block away. I said, man, I know where some pop bottles are. We can go get us some money and get us a pop and a sandwich or something. So we went down there and we stole his pop bottles a few times. And just like any other sin, you know, it, it keeps you longer than you ever thought you'd stay, and it costs you more than you ever wanted to pay. And we got greedy. I said, man, we need to go back and get some of them 32-ounce pop bottles. They were like a quarter. So we got down there, and there was just way too many of them. It's all recorded right here. And so in my criminal mind, I said, hey, wait right here. I know somebody's got some sacks and boxes. My little friend said, who's that? And I said, Clinton's mama. So I went around the house, and I knocked on the front door, and I said, Miss Watson, do you have any paper sacks or boxes that we can borrow to steal her own pop bottles? She said, well, of course, little Sherman, I got them. She gave me, and I said, thank you, ma'am. Went around behind her house, stole her pop bottles. It's all written right here. When Clinton was a, senior everyone else had their name beside their senior picture and all their accolades and all their achievements clinton just had his name somebody in the yearbook staff sent in the final draft of that page with beside his name wasn't Clinton it said Klingon and as the yearbook editor they never did know it was me but God had it written right here The yearbooks came out and they started passing them out and everybody started writing that bull in them, you know. Uh, we're going to be friends forever, you know. Ten days later, they don't remember your name. You're my best friend forever, all that stuff. And someone noticed. His parents came up there. We want them all recalled. We well, couldn't recall them all. They were scattered all over the county. And nobody ever knew. But God and you. Now, maybe you don't understand what imputation means. It's just a big theological word. But what it means is, this is the book of my life. And when I got saved, God started tearing pages out of my book. Where there is no record of the pot bottles. There's no record of the Klingon. There's no record of the using an epileptic to steal candy. And all of those sins are not imputed to me. 
They're gone. They're not any record of them. And then after the moment I was born again, when I got born again, the Bible says you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day you see Him face to face. The book was sealed. And every sin that I've committed since that day has not been imputed to me. It has not been written down. And when you look at this book, it still says Sherman Jacobus, but it says Sherman Jacobus, the righteousness of Christ. His life, his sinful life. Your problem's not motivation. I'm, I'm convinced. Your problem is you don't know this. His life, his sinless life got imputed to me. And when God looks at my record, it says, Jesus, righteousness. Sherman Jacobs. The righteousness of Christ. And my sins of the past have been ripped out, not recorded, and the sins of the future have not been written down. It's imputation. My life, my sins, got imputed to Him. Now you can't get a better deal. If you understood that, you'd be telling people about it. And if you understood that people come here that are living a life of sin, they need somebody that loves them enough to tell them about this good news. Don't tell me how you love them when you're okay with them just walking out in their sin. You can't convince me that you know about this. Look at 2 Corinthians. Oh, we did that imputed sin imputation look at Romans 4 Romans 4 verse 6 even as David also described the blessedness of a man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works saying blessed are they whose sins iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now don't get me wrong. After you're saved, your sins are not recorded. But you will reap what you sow in your fleshly body. If you just keep on sinning, you'll reap what you sow. But they're not recorded against your soul and spirit. Does that make sense? And when we refuse to tell people this, shame on us. Some people, Paul says, they don't have the knowledge of God. He said, you know what? I put that against your shame. Well, I don't want him putting that against me. Everybody in this church is going to know from me the knowledge of God. I don't hopefully ever come down condescending on sinners. I'm one of the biggest ones. I'm the chief. But what I want to do is share with you that you've been deceived. You think you're having fun. You're not. You don't understand what's offered. Number two, justification. Now, some of you just said, oh my God, he said he had seven. I, don't, I ain't a mind reader, but I know you view. Justification. It's just as if I had never sinned. God justifies you. He's the judge. He can justify who He wants. And in this salvation, it's so great a salvation because one part of it is that God justifies you. He throws away your past sins and He does not impute your future sins. And so you're just as if you had never sinned. And in the Bible, in theology, it's called justification. It's not an act you do. It's a gift that's given to you. It's a place. It's an honor. My old sins are gone. My future sins are not recorded. Justified. 
justified by the blood of God Himself. Look at Numbers 23, 21. One of my favorite scriptures. Now, a little backstory. You got this evil devil-worshipping, Baal-worshipping king, Balak. He goes to a false prophet of Israel, Balaam, and he offers him a whole bunch of money to curse Israel. And what God tells Balaam, he says, you can't curse them. They're my children. Listen, I, I, I don't want to hear you cursing my children. Watch this. He hath, this is what Balaam told Balak. God told me, he hath not beheld iniquity or sin in Jacob. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. Are you kidding me, Jacob? Jacob was the low down, sorriest sinner that ever sinned. God said, I don't see any sin in Jacob. The Israeli people were so perverse. They were so sexually deviant. They would have babies just to kill them. God said, I don't see any perverseness in my little Israel. Well, is that true? Hey, listen, God's the one keeping the record. What he's saying to this devil-worshiping king Those are my kids. That's none of your business. And how I deal with them, don't worry. God's always dealt with Israel. Oh, man. And he's always dealt with us, has he not? But he don't want somebody else making some accusation. That's the greatest news anyone can ever hear in this life. And if you think I'm not going to shout it from this pulpit, shame on you. I care about people. I care about where they go. I care about where they spend eternity. One day I'm going to stand before God. Do you think God's going to say, you know what, I was really upset with you that day, that little teenager that was... um, misunderstood and deceived and you told her what she was doing was wrong. You didn't have any right. You think that conversation is going to happen? Look at Romans 8.33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Now the Southern Baptist Convention would like to lay some things to my charge. But God won't let them. The largest religious denomination in the world. And he tells them, keep your hands off his book. It's sealed. Well, we'd like to write down there that he made fun of us. Yeah, and that was one of the happiest days of his life. There's a lot of people that would like to lay a charge at you. God will not allow them. Who who could lay a charge at God's elect? You read it? Nobody. Your old sins are ripped out of your book. Your new sins are not being recorded. They're not imputed to you. They're nailed to a cross. What do you think happened on the cross? Number three, propitiation. That's a big old word, ain't it? Propitiation. Most people will tell you it means payment. But it means more than just paying your debt to God. It means paying your debt that satisfies God's demands. In other words, you could work your whole life to try to pay back your debt and you couldn't satisfy God. You could get a hundred people to give their life for you and work and work and work for God and it wouldn't satisfy God. You needed a payment of propitiation that would satisfy God's demands. And the only thing that fit that payment was God's blood Himself. Propitiation. Look at Romans 3.21. Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness 
of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness or the right standing of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a, here's our word, propitiation through faith in His blood (coughs) to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believed in Jesus. It's His righteousness. Do you understand what we just read? That is the greatest news For every sinner. You say, well, I I, I don't want to tell them about this. It might upset them. Shame on you. Well, I'm just not called to do that. Well, you missed last week's service. You don't look for a call. Volunteer. I tell you, I think it's lack of knowledge of God. Because if you understood what God is offering to every sinner, you could not keep from telling them. I don't think it's motivation at all. I think the knowledge of God would motivate you. It's more than praying my debt or paying my debt to God. It's a payment that satisfies God's demands. Look at 1 John 2. 1 John 2, here we go. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Quit sinning, man. Try not to sin. Quit sinning. And if any man sin, but you know, you're going to sin because you're still stuck in this flesh, on this armpit we call earth, If any man sin, that if there is when any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You couldn't ask for a better lawyer. And he is the propitiation, the payment that satisfied God for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know Charlie Manson is forgiven? You say, you think Charlie Manson going to heaven? Oh, no, no. No, I didn't say that. I just said he was forgiven. Well, then why come he won't go to heaven? Because he won't receive it. Are you trying to tell me Charlie Manson could honestly receive salvation today? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Do you know everyone in hell is forgiven? Well, then why are they in hell? Because they refuse to believe it. You know the people that dip snuff? They think all the smokers are going to hell. You ever notice that? They'll always, the worst sin is the sin that you do that I don't do. All the cussers think the gossipers are going to hell. They're going to hell for sure. Those blankety blank gossipers are going to hell. Listen, every one of us was on our way. Until somebody cared enough to share with us the knowledge of God. I'm not gay or nothing. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to look up that old preacher that was preaching that revival. That preached that message that shared with me the knowledge of God. One, I was going to hell. Two, I didn't have to. And when I look him up, I'm going to give him a big kiss. Watch this. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 
Well, propitiation. It's a payment that satisfies God's demand. Number four, sanctification. Okay? Stay with me. Sanctification means set apart. Now, Donnie, where's Donnie at? Donnie, come here. Can I use you just for a second? You look like you're used. Come up here, Donnie. You're going to represent a guy that uh, comes to salvation, okay? Come over here because I'm in front of the speaker. So, okay. So, stay with me, right? Sanctification. What does that mean? I'm going to show you. The word means set apart. That's all it means. The Catholics make saints out of people. Uh, there ain't no pope that's ever lived could make a saint out of anybody. People have ideals that the word saint means a person that's better than anyone else. That's not what the word means. Some people think a saint is someone who doesn't sin. And the Catholics pray to them and all that's hogwash. The word means set apart. So, Donnie, hang on. We're going to let this side of the room represent all the low-down, sorry, lost sinners. And all the people over here said, amen, amen. right, yeah, amen. Because, I mean, where else could you pick some, you know, sure couldn't pick them from over here. And we're going to let this side of the room represent all of God's family, okay? So when this low-down, sorry, no-count sinner comes to Christ and receives the knowledge of God, one of the things he gets is propitiation. He gets justification. He gets uh, imputation. And he also gets sanctification. And what happens is God pulls him from all of these sorry, no count, lost sinners going to hell. And he, kingdom of darkness, right? Children of the devil, right? Right, Donnie? Right. You can testify about them. That's a bunch of sinners, ain't it? And he sets this man apart in his family. And he tells him, you come right over here and you sit right here until I call you home. Now, he's set apart. Now, his struggle is he's in the family of God. But he wants to act like the family of the devil. So now he has a battle. God has separated him. He set him apart. His soul and his spirit is going to be separated in the family of God until God takes him home. But his problem is he's in a fleshly body that God really don't care much about. So he ain't, let's just be honest, he ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer. And he hears some of those over there holler name to come back. Go ahead, holler name. Come on, tell them like you tell them how you got that marijuana. Come on. Some of you, some of you, you got a car. Tell them how you, you got some new gummies. Well, this this ignorant fool, he likes gummies. So he gets up. Now God separated him. He goes over there and he's like, all right, preacher's wife, give me one of them gummies. I'm back. <laughs> now he can come over here and he can do whatever. Let's say his problem ain't gummies. Let's say his problem's alcohol. And he can come back over here with all these devil worshiping, sorry, no count people. And they'll, you know what they'll do? They'll buy you drink after drink after drink. I had a friend at Red Pump. I led him to the Lord. He was on fire for the Lord. He was 60 years old when he got saved. He was a branch pulled out of the fire. And all those other no-count, sorry, devil-worshiping friends of his, they always went on a fishing trip. They started telling him, Whoa, aren't you going to come fishing with us? Aren't you going to come fishing this year? He would come by and talk to me. He said, man, I know better than to go fishing with them people, man. They're going to be trying to get me to drink. I said, well, 
But Sonny, don't go. I know, but they're my friends. I said, well, you're going to have to decide what to do. They finally harped at him. Come on, harp at him a little bit. Yeah, you know that beer's cold. Nani, he liked that beer. About the third day, he broke down. And he drank one. He said, Sherman, it was blistering hot. And he, he said, I, and let me tell you something. Drinking pop with foam on top ain't going to send you to hell. But guess what all they did? They turned on him. And they started laughing at him and jeering at him. Oh, I thought you were saved. He come back to work on Monday, a broken man. I said, Sonny, that beer ain't going to send you to hell. He said, I know, but I lost my witness. I said, yeah, you did. You destroyed it. But I said, just to them idiots and just for a little bit of time, God has separated you. God has set you apart. All you got to do is get your fat hind in and get back over there where God put you. He was broken and he kept telling me, he said, I keep asking God to forgive me. I said, if you've asked God to forgive you, forget it. He's forgot it. He's not put it to your charge. He didn't know anything about that. I said, he's not imputed that to you. You're forgiven. Now act like it. Let me tell you something. These people over here, they don't love you like these people over here, Donnie. That's right. Sanctification, it means set apart. God takes you out of the kingdom of darkness and he places you in the kingdom of light. And not just that, but he puts you in his family. The Apostle Paul writes about this conversion uh, on the road to Damascus when the Holy Spirit knocked him off his donkey. Jesus Christ appeared to him and he said, Acts 26 verse 16, this is what Jesus said to Paul but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto you. 17, Deliver, uh, delivering thee from the people. You got delivered from them people, Donnie. Don't go back. And from the Gentiles. There's a bunch of Gentiles over here. Unto whom now I send you to open their eyes. You don't understand. If you can get this today, you have the knowledge of God. You can be an agent, an ambassador of the kingdom of God to go around opening the eyes of people because they don't know this. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Do you understand sanctification? Next, and I'm hurrying, regeneration. The key word in that is genes. He regenerates you. Your genes are changed. Your genes in your body come from your mom and dad. You're born again, then you become the generation of God. It is to be regened. You're born of the Spirit. God's Spirit, born of God. Look at 1 Peter 1.23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You are born again. You are what? 2 Corinthians 5.17. You are what? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. <coughs> Behold, all things are become new. When you are born again, one thing that you receive is regeneration. You become a new creature. Six, predestination. Ephesians 1, 4, and 6. Donnie, you sat right there. Ephesians 1. 4 and 6, according to hath he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose you before you were ever born, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. You were not predestined before you received Jesus Christ. You are predestined to be in his family after you received Christ. 
to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved. You are predestined. There is nothing you can do about it. When you are born again, you are regened. You are predestined. He can go back over there and get gummies from Peggy every day. His soul and spirit is still going to heaven. And God says, John the Baptist would quicker fall out of heaven and hit the earth before he could fall out of God's grace. I get so upset with these people that do not have the knowledge of God. And they go around thinking, uh, I'm saved, yippee, yippee. Oh no, I lost it. Oh, you know what? I prayed through and I, and I was slain in the Spirit and I got it back. <laughs> and then I lost it before I left the parking lot. Come on, people. Lastly, Romans 8, 29, 31. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son. You, Donnie, you're going to look just like his son one day, whether you like it or not. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know you hear that all the time. People don't have a knowledge of God. You hear that at a stupid baseball game. Now listen, boys, we can win this game because God's for us. Well, hey, you got a coach in the other dugout telling the other team the same thing. Let's pray and ask God to help us win this stupid game. Now who can be against you? Because God's for you. Because He's predestined you. you got a destiny. One last thing. Glorification. Look at 1 John 3, 2. 1 John 3, 2. This great salvation. The end of it is glorification. When you see Him face to face. When you lay down this fleshly body that hinders you so. And you are given a glorified body. It's a fleshly body. But it doesn't have any blood. It has bones and flesh and a spirit that's been quickened and birthed by God. And it's a glorified body just like Jesus had when he resurrected. You can eat anything you want. Don't get fat. That alone ought to be enough. Watch what it says. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. You understand what that means? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't have a clue, but we know this. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Sorry I held you a little long, but I want to tell you something. This great salvation, I want to break it down for you. It's imputation. Your sins of the past are ripped out of your book. They are gone. Your sins in the future are not imputed to you. They are imputed to Christ on the cross. And you have the imputation of the life of righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed on your behalf. Justification. There's nothing you can do. It's a gift that God gives you. He justifies you. Just as if you had never sinned. Well, that means I just keep on sinning. No, fool. Propitiation. It's not paying for your sins only. It's a payment that God demands that satisfies His demands. Propitiation. Sanctification. God sets you apart. You're different. You know, you always hear, well, I'm Christians, they think they're different. Yeah, 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 we are. We should be. Sanctification. Regeneration. You're a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Everything. Predestination. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Listen, I say this. People just pass out. I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. Last but not least, glorification. 
Now, I hope Donnie don't mind. Stand up here with me, Donnie. Me and Donnie are a great example of a couple of broken men. I don't know if you know Donnie's story, but you ought to hear Donnie tell it. Fell out of a tree on his head, broke his neck. His good buddies threw him in the back of a truck and trying to get him to the hospital so fast when they went around the corner, slung him out of the back of the truck. The only thing, the only good thing in the story is they didn't back up over him when they backed up to pick him up. I'm almost as bad. I slipped on that godforsaken ramp. <laughs> I'm standing up here right now with a shattered ankle. I got an EMT back there. He should look at me when this is over. I'm, I'm positive my hip is broke. My finger is dislocated. But one day, one day, Donnie's going to get a glorified body. It'll get matched with his born again soul and spirit. Donnie won't have to wrestle with this body that's had things that have broken it and ailed it. One of these days I'm going to be given a glorified body that'll last for eternity. Full head of hair. Rip tabs. <laughs> Why do y'all laugh on that? So can you. You know, I don't think it's motivation. I think people lack motivation because they don't have an education of what it is they're supposed to share. And let me tell you something. If you've received all of those seven things, and you know that, and you see people that are lost, and you, by a choice of your own free will, refuse to share with them the good news, shame on you. Stand to your feet. Donnie, I'm going to ask you to pray and dismiss us. Well, I thank you for this day and I thank you for the words that Sir Mr. Shepherd. You know, for a long time I was broken. There's a lot of people in this world that are broken. But they just don't want to wrap their head around the good, good news that you brought this world and they just don't want to believe it. They just turn their head to go the other way and keep doing the same old stuff to do. So I pray that the Lord that they must just open their hearts and hear what you say and then come to you when everybody says they get saved. And this world will be a much better place. So once again, I thank you for this day. Just give it us and thank you another good morning. Much went about church. Thank you for the good brothers we had. And just doing our prayer. Amen. Amen. Hope to see you tonight at 5, if not at 6.